So today I'm going to give a bit of an introduction to what's called the density of states, uh, which is an important piece of mathematics in singular learning theory, which we haven't uh, discussed fully until now. It's an idea that appears uh, particularly in physics. I think it's maybe not super common in statistics as far as I know. So just to introduce it in the language that Watanabe uses, uh, the density of states, which he writes, I'm not sure if it's V or nu, or maybe I'll just write V. So I'll explain what it means. It's perhaps the easiest way to understand the meaning of the RLCT, which we've discussed. So the density of states is some real valued function of a real parameter T and its asymptotic behavior as T approaches zero is, as we'll see in some examples, controlled by the singularities of the set of true parameters. So the density of states is a function associated to a triple, p, q, phi, and it uh, has both a straightforward interpretation and uh, illustrates the effect of the RLCT. So that's why it's um, a topic of interest. All right. <clears throat> So in solid state physics, so if you do a course on solid state physics or condensed matter physics, you'll encounter the density of states very early. Usually referred to as just DOS and written as D rather than V. So I'm going to stick to writing D just because that's what you'll encounter in the references. So by the way, the notes for this uh, seminar are on the seminar webpage and they have references to textbooks and other, and other sources for digging into this further. So the density of states uh, is defined as follows. For a system with n discrete configurations, I'll worry about the continuous case in a moment. And a good example would be a, a particle in a box in quantum mechanics. Assuming uh, some limit on the possible momentum, the Possible wave functions are quantized depending on the size of the box, and so there's finitely many, call them n. Uh, in discrete configurations and volume V, the density of states is dE, E is an energy, so it's per unit volume, how many of the possible states have that energy. EI is the energy of the ith state. The order in which you, I mean, the, the set of states is some finite set, the order doesn't matter. It's just enumerate all the possible states. Each one has an energy, and then this is the chronica delta. So this is one if E is equal to EI and zero otherwise. Right? So this just counts the number of states with the given energy E per unit volt. So for a continuous system, we of course have to do something a little bit different.
uh, just to foreshadow where we're going to connect this back to statistics, uh, you can think of the loss function uh, or KL divergence K as being something like energy, right? So if you want to count the number of states with a given energy, that's a bit like counting the number of configurations of your neural network, the number of weights, which have a given value of the KL divergence K, for example. Um, of course, that's not an integer, right? You have to think about the measure of that set, perhaps, but we'll come back to that. But that's the analogy we're going to make later. All right, so for a continuous system, Instead, you define the density of states at energy E to be 1 over the volume. The number of states which have energy less than or equal to E plus delta E, so I will define N in a moment. So NE is the number or the measure of the set of states with energy less than or equal to E. Okay, so this is uh, clearly the rate of change of the number of states with energy less than or equal to E as you increase E. So that is. Uh, DE is the number of new states, newly accessible states per unit volume uh, when the maximum allowed energy is increased. So a typical example in a solid state physics textbook would be something like a conductor. Uh, and you will have, depending on the material, certain energy bands that are occupied by electrons. And as you increase the allowed energy, well, the number of available states for your system uh, increases. It doesn't decrease, of course, because uh, it's less than or equal to E. If a state is accessible at energy E, it's accessible at energy E plus delta E. So this n is a monotonically, well, it's a non-decreasing function of the energy. Uh, and as you increase the energy, more and more potential states are available. And if that number is changing very rapidly at a given sort of threshold value of the energy, then that's physically very meaningful. So that's why it's an important central idea in solid state physics. So I want to illustrate this with the simplest possible example. which is a free electron gas in D dimensions. So, and if you don't have a background in physics, it doesn't matter. I think it's just useful to illustrate uh, a place in which these concepts also appear so that they maybe don't seem so specific to singular learning theory. So for a free electron gas in D dimensions, States are parameterized by wave vectors, which just give the frequency of the wave function in all the d directions. And the energy of such a state, so k is a vector, and it's given by, uh, it's not k, it's h bar h bar squared on 2m k squared. k squared just here meaning the norm. So k dot with itself. So the total number of states of energy less than or equal to E
Well, that's just asking for the volume of a sphere. I mean, there's this there's this factor here, right? So it's not you have to adjust the radius accordingly, but who cares? It's just a constant factor in front. Um, so it's of a d sphere of radius e to the one half. So that number is proportional to e to the d on two. So that means that d, by the above formula, since it's the derivative of uh, ne with respect to e, it is proportional to e to the d on 2 minus 1. And you might recognize that. So this is going to be the density of states for a regular model. Right, so if you think about the possible states of a neural network, well, not a neural network because that's singular, but if you have a regular model, like um, just a, a simple Gaussian parameterized by its, uh, say, mean, uh, then the density of states of that looks like um, exactly this example where D is the number of parameters. And more interesting systems, so this came back to the fact the form of the density of states in that case came back to the formula for the energy. In more complicated systems, that's a more complicated function of k. The more complicated the function of k, the more interesting the density of states. All right. Um, so let me now switch over to uh, purely mathematics. Well, maybe I'll make one comment. So one of the reasons to introduce this connection to physics is just to point out that uh, singularities appear in solid state physics for exactly the same reason they appear in statistical learning theory. This density of states uh, depends on the complexity of this energy function. K squared is a simple function. It is singular but uh, in a very mild sense, so it's a Morse function. If you change k squared to k cubed or higher powers of k, and by that I mean the norm of k to a higher power, then you get more interesting singularities and more interesting density of states and more interesting physics. And this is something that's a very active topic in solid state physics. Um, you can look up terms like Van Hove singularities and so on, magic angles. Uh, you can see references in the notes for that. All right, so to come back to a purely mathematical setting, uh, I want to talk about the volume between level sets. So I'm going to fix an open subset of R to the N and a smooth function on U. So in physics, P would be the energy E. And in statistical learning theory, this would be K. So you can, of course, partition the set U into level sets, right? So just take the pre-image under P of every value T of U. Um, so maybe it's worth drawing a, a picture just to kind of make the point that not all level sets are the same. It's a kind of generic behavior and special fibers. So such a pre-image is sometimes called a fiber if it's thought of as having geometric structure. Okay, so a generic fiber, so 
Let's call it T generic. So this is R. If you pick a generic value and look at all the elements of U that have that value, so this is P inverse T generic. It looks like that picture, that picture is meant to communicate that this thing here uh, is a submanifold. That is, it looks like R, right, in my picture. And it looks like R sitting inside R2. And in my picture, this plane in which this fiber sits is, is U, right? But there will be special values where the pre-image doesn't look like that. So maybe P inverse T0 has a point here which, uh, so the fiber is not a sub-manifold here. Or maybe, maybe it looks like this. So what I want you to think about now is the, the pre-image of nearby values. So if I were to take a value down here, um, let's call it T0 prime, I guess, and to take its pre-image. Well, generically, if you perturb the value a little bit, the pre-image is now not singular. That is, it is a submanifold as I've drawn it. So it's sort of like this case. Uh, except as you make these values closer and closer, it, it becomes, uh, in some sense, I mean, it's always a submanifold, but uh, its properties start to reflect the singularity, this point that I've indicated, where the fiber is not a submanifold. Okay, so that's part of the context of what I'm about to talk about. Now, what's the relevance to the density of states? Well, Consider flooding the graph. So flood the graph. Well, not really flood the graph. Uh, flood, flood you. So that is, I want you to consider looking at the set U and kind of filling in everything to the left of a given level set. Now, the way I've drawn it, uh, increasing t goes this way. So as I increase t, I've got this sort of march of level sets, right? And they're moving across the page. And as I do that, I'm filling up more and more. And how much new volume do I acquire uh, at each step, right? So this is a small change in the value, induces a change in the level sets, and this is the intermediate volume. So that's uh, how we're going to define the general density of states. Okay, so let me now do that. Uh, I guess, well, I sort of need to talk about regular values and critical values first. Okay, so now we want to give a formal definition of how, f what, uh, how much volume is covered by the flood as hey, we Dan, move towards your left a little bit from the, the level set at t 
to the level okay. set at t plus delta t. But this doesn't really make sense at the singular values. Uh, if you look at the at the picture, uh, the singular values were not. Um, I guess it's hard to explain why it doesn't make sense before I've said what I'm about to say. So maybe I'll skip that comment. So just accept for the moment that there's a complication here when we try and make a formal definition, which is that it won't really work at those fibers which are singular. All right. Um, okay, so some observations to clarify what I've said on the previous board informally. So for generic T, The pre-image is a sub-manifold of dimension n minus one. Um, don't remember if I gave a value to the dimension. I said u was an open subset of Rn, right? Yeah. Okay, so more precisely, uh, If the gradient of P is non-zero, non-zero vector at every point X in U with PX equal T, that is in the pre-image, well then P has rank one. Uh, in an open neighborhood of a closed set P inverse T. And then it's a standard theorem that uh, this must be a submanifold. I'm not really justifying why this is true for a generic T, right? So the statement I've just made is that if this is non-zero, then it's a submanifold. So uh, why, why do I know this is the generic behavior? Well, that's by Saad's theorem. So by Saad's theorem, the set of critical values, that is the T for which the pre-image is a, not a submanifold. Uh, so the set of critical values of P, i.e. Uh, the T in R such that P inverse T is not a submanifold. So T0 and T1 on the previous board are examples of critical values. Uh, that set of critical values has measure zero. Okay, so that's what I mean by generic. Right, except for some uh, measure zero set of exceptions, like in the previous board where T0 and T1 were just individual points and everything else I was kind of indicating had a pre-image which was a sub-manifold. Uh, so that's what we have. So some language. I'm going to write crit P for the set of all X in U where the gradient so all partial derivatives of P are zero. T and R is a regular value. If it is uh, well, one way of saying it is the pre-image doesn't make, meet the set of critical points i.e. it is not a critical value. So regular value and critical value are two terms I want to use. So T0 and T1 are critical values and T generic and T0 prime and T0 double prime are regular values. So when we talk about filling up U by dragging these level sets across the picture, I want to pay attention just to regular values of T. Okay. So let's give it a heuristic. Uh, 
I'm going to start with this sort of heuristic uh, motivation for how to define the density of states, and then I'll, um, if there's time, talk about the sort of proper you know, differential form way of doing it. So defining the density of states. So U and P as above. Let T and R be a regular value. Well, since the regular value values are generic, there's an open neighborhood of T and R consisting of regular values. And let's let H be sufficiently small that all these level sets, I'll call them SH, which means I take the nearby level set at T plus with value T plus H. Let's assume that they're all submanifolds, which I can do by the previous sentence. So set. So we're going to consider those level sets. And I'm going to draw a picture of them. So here's, uh, here's S0, which is just the pre-image of T. And then here's SH. OK, so on the pre-image, so on S0, by hypothesis, T is a regular value. So the gradient of P is non-zero everywhere. And I'm going to draw those in as green lines. So um, now I want you to notice that I'm drawing them of different sizes for some reason. Can you figure out why, or do you agree that they, first of all, why should they point to this level set? And secondly, why are the ones up here longer? So these are all nabla p. Why are they shorter down here? Anybody? Okay, so this this has got the partial derivatives of p in it, right? So if you were to tailor expand p near this point, you would be making use of um, the gradient of p at that point. The larger the partial derivatives, the more quickly p will increase. Right? So here, uh, I guess this shouldn't be longer than the one to its left. Um, here the partial derivatives are large because that vector is large, but that means p increases quickly. So in order to get the value of p to increase from t to t plus h, that's what this is, if I want to increase that value of P from T to T plus H, and the partial derivatives are large, it takes less, uh, it takes less to do that, right? So the level set is closer. I need to change the value of X, the input, less in order to increase the value of P by that fixed amount H if the gradient of P is large. Okay, so that's why down here, you see that it's far away because the gradient is small. It takes a long time to increase to that level set. Okay, um, so let's do, uh, so the Taylor series expansion looks like the following. If I start at a point X, so this is my X, and I travel along the gradient at X, that's approximately P at X plus sum over I H 
right? I get one of these partial derivatives just because it's already in there, the second one from the Taylor series expansion. So that's Px plus h lambda p squared. So what I'm trying to figure out is, is how to measure the, the volume in between these two level sets, right? So to get a volume, I need to add up squares. And to get squares, I'm going to sort of pick out something like that and worry about its volume. So that's what I'm doing right now. But I want to work out what this distance here is. OK. So how am I going to work out that distance? Well, I can solve an equation involving this, right? I know that I get to here when the value of p increases to t plus h. OK, so if we assume x is in S0, and then set t plus h equal to the above, and solve for, t solve for um, uh, well, not quite h, right, because this is not a unit vector. Maybe, maybe I'll write this slightly differently. Um, so uh, let me write that as the magnitude of the gradient at x times a unit vector in the direction of the gradient at x. So this here is, is this distance, right? So this, this distance d is, is that quantity, and h is what we get to change there. OK, so if we solve for t plus h, we get t plus h uh, is equal to, well, that's t already, right? So it's t plus h nabla p squared. That's nabla p at x, right? Uh, and that gives us h equals h nabla p squared. Uh, what did I do wrong here? Um, no, I shouldn't have called this h, right? It's uh, a bad choice of letter. Um, maybe I should just call it let yeah, me rewrite this equation and um, yeah, it's not it's not h. I don't know what letter to call it now, but I call it d prime. It's related to d d prime d prime. Prime. All right, so we get d prime d prime is equal to h on nabla p squared. But the actual distance d is equal to d prime times nabla p. So that means that the actual distance is h on nabla p. That's what I was getting at, All right? So that's that's this distance here. So if we want to work out the volume in between these level sets, we just have to take this distance, multiply it by a line element here, use that to get a rectangle, and then sum over multiple such rectangles. Any questions? I'll write down. So basically, we're going to integrate h over nabla p along S0. And that's the definition of the density of states. OK, so the picture we end up with is the following. 
just straightening things out a little bit. This is S0. Here's our point X. I've got uh, delta X here. This is my level set SH. I make delta X sufficiently small that it uh, everything looks kind of straight like this. This is H on on this. And that's the area element. So the volume in between the level sets S0 and SH. Now, maybe it's worth commenting at this point what goes wrong if nabla p is 0 somewhere. If nabla p was 0 somewhere, then this level set might meet that one, right? Because it just the value doesn't move. Uh, and then, well, this, this square thing doesn't make any sense. So let's write it vol from the level set associated to t to the level set associated to t plus h is the sum over all those rectangles, which is to say it's the integral over S0 of h on nabla p, which is a function, a vector-valued function. Well, that's vector-valued, and that's scalar-valued defined on S0. And with respect to some line element on S0. And uh, and S0 may not be finite, right? So, so we can put some regularization by with compact support. to make that actually finite. You can, of course, vary phi, which means that what I've just defined is a distribution rather than a number, right? It's a, a gadget that takes in a finitely supported kind of test function, compactly supported test function, and gives you a number. OK, but I hope that's pretty clear. So that's how we get this volume between level sets that I was drawing before. OK, so it's coming back to the density of states. Uh, it is reasonable to identify. So now think about P as being the energy. And dragging this level set to the right is increasing the available energy. And you get more states. And the states are the points in U. If you count how many states have become newly accessible, well, that's exactly this volume in between these level sets. So then the density of states at T can be reasonably defined to be 1 on V. Remember, the density of states is per unit volume. Uh, v, you know, you can sort of define however you like, but if if phi is fixed, then it would be the integral. I mean, that's some um, some measure. And then one on h vol t t plus h. Well, remember the density of states had a term in it that looked like n e plus delta e minus n e on delta e. Right, so that's what I've just written. It's just H instead of delta E. And that volume is exactly that difference between the number of accessible states, except now I'm integrating to count states rather than um, using phi, rather than just talking about a number. And then from the definition, as we've written it, that is uh, that cancels this H here, cancels that H there. So. We end up with the final definition of the density of states, which is one on some kind of volume. Doesn't matter too much what that is. The integral over the level set, so S0 is the pre-image of T, of phi divided by nabla P along S0. OK, so that's our definition of the density of states. Uh, Right, so that's a, what I've given you so far is a motivation for that definition, not really a, a derivation. 
uh, you can do a more sophisticated form of this argument and um, you know, fill in the details about the distributions I kind of hinted at. That's all done in the notes, uh, but I guess I won't have time for that. Okay, so that's the density of states. I want to compute this in an example and show how it's different in a regular case and something like a singular case. Are there any questions? Okay, uh, maybe I'm going to keep that diagram because it's a nice. Example. Well, the simplest example is just to take a sum of squares. So what are the regular values? Well, if I'm looking at the pre-image of P, I'm looking at a sphere of a certain radius, right? The sphere is a submanifold of Rn. I mean, I'm talking about the n minus 1 sphere. That's a submanifold of Rn, unless I look at for the sphere of radius 0. Uh, that's not a submanifold. Well, it's not a submanifold of dimension one less. Right? So that's that's the only um, singular value. That's the only place where the gradient is the zero vector. For t not equal to zero, the level set S zero is a sphere of radius t to the one half. And if I compute the integral in the density of states, so the integral over S0, that's the sphere of one over the gradient of this function on the sphere, uh, you can do a little calculation and see that that's proportional to t to the n on 2 minus 1, which is what we saw before, right? That was exactly the calculation of uh, I didn't really do the calculation. I just stated that in the example of a free electron gas, you would end up with a density of states, which was e to the d on 2 minus 1. And d is now n, but that's the same calculation. So that example, in the physical sense, um, well, in the statistical sense, that's a, a sort of, I don't know, geometric sense. That's a regular example, right? Because this function is a sum of squares. So you see something to do with the volume of a sphere and its derivative, which is which is this. Okay. Um, so one thing to note is that uh, so that means the density of states is proportional to the same thing, right? The difference is just this volume factor. So that means that as t approaches zero, so that is as you have, you've got, so the picture you should have in your mind when you see this is a sphere which is collapsing. Right? Because t is the um, square of the radius. And as the sphere collapses, and I'm doing this integral over the sphere, well, two things are happening, right? One thing is that the thing over which I'm integrating is becoming smaller. But this is also changing, right? So uh, as I'm making t smaller and smaller, well, I'm evaluating the gradient here. So this is a point x, and that point x is closer and closer to the origin, so that will be 
smaller in norm, which means this quantity here is decreasing as t goes to zero, which means that ratio is becoming very large. But this set over which I'm inter integrating is decreasing. So I have this kind of fight between the integrand, which is growing very large, and the space over which I'm integrating, which is becoming very small in measure. So uh, both, depending on the example, either can win. In this case, it happens that uh, the sort of the trend towards zero wins. But that's not always the case. So let me give you an example where the opposite trend, the trend of the integrand to increase to infinity wins. All right, and I guess that's what I'll finish on. So let P be x squared minus y squared. So t equals 0 is a singular value. Uh, the level set at t equals 0 is this thing here which is not a submanifold of R2. Take U to be some ball around the origin, it doesn't matter. So this is S0, P inverse T. Well, T is 0. So for small h, this is a hyperbola. So it looks like looks like this. And the points plus or minus root h zero are in SH. And those points have the gradient of P equal to the square root of 2h, as you can easily compute. So that means that, as I was just saying before, that ratio goes to infinity at these points as h goes to 0. And so as you, make, as you make this level set approach the 0 level set, uh, the gradient at those points, I guess it doesn't, points rather in the opposite direction, right? This is the gradient. Uh, those vectors become smaller and smaller, so one over them becomes larger and larger. So that's the integrand. Okay, so I'm gonna give an explicit phi, just so we can actually compute the integral. I guess that doesn't have compact support. Uh, <laughs> well, depends how I choose u. So choose u to be a closed disk at the origin, and then that's fine. Then as h goes to zero, this integral that I'm doing, s zero by on nabla p, uh, what it looks like is the following integral. You can do the calculation. And that diverges. And what that means is that the density of states, I guess I used T already, I'll use S. The density of states approaches infinity as S approaches zero. In the previous sort of regular case where P was the sum of squares, the density of states uh, went to zero. Now, what does that mean? I mean in terms of the interpretation of the number of accessible states or whatever. Well, the density of states going to zero means that uh, near that level set, as you vary the level set, the volume 
doesn't change very much. Right? Whereas in this case, the closer you make that blue level set, SH, to the let zero level set, uh, for a given change in the value, you'll get more and more volume. Right? I mean, it's the rate of change of the volume with the with the value that you that you're um, varying. So it takes a little bit of thought to get that clear in your head, maybe. But um, so that's a very different situation, and it's actually one of the keys to understanding why singularities affect uh, the Bayesian posterior and learning and so on. Um, okay, so I think I'll make that connection briefly and then stop. So I haven't mentioned the RLCT yet, but I'm now going to bring that into the story. Okay, so the divergence ds to infinity in this case uh, means that for sufficiently small h and s, sufficiently small h and s sufficiently close zero. So this ratio, which is what the density of states is, one over h, the volume between these level sets, may be made arbitrarily large. So relative to the size in the change, that is h. So in that example, I had these two lines, that's two parts of the hyperbola, and then I've got two level sets, say. This in here is the volume. So that's vol s, s plus h. So for a given... Uh, Maybe I should label the level sets. So that's S, um, S, and that's S, S plus H. All right, so if I take S sufficiently close to zero, so I take this level set sufficiently close to the hyperbola, and um, for sufficiently small H, That change in volume, so well, the volume that I've colored in dark blue there, can be much, I mean, for all sufficiently small values of h, so maybe don't worry about the constraint on h. Um, that volume can be very large, arbitrarily large, if you make this level set on the left close to the hyperbola. So that chain, that volume that I've colored in can be arbitrarily, an arbitrarily factor larger than the uh, change in the value, so like sort of moving along the the, um, the copy of R that was at the bottom of the other graph that controls which level sets I'm taking. Okay. So we see that in the behavior of the density of states as t goes to zero, uh, can be complicated and depends intricately on the original function, that is, on p uh, and its values. Near, um, near singular level sets. That is the pre-image of critical values. It's important here that this, this level set, which was the zero level set, was not a submanifold. If it were a submanifold, uh, I would always get the behavior where the density of states goes to zero as, as T or S uh, goes to zero. 
So near a singular level set, the density of states can behave in the way that I've just described for x squared minus y squared. It can behave um, very differently to this case in the sum of squares. And indeed, so one can show that uh, when P is the KL divergence, it's true more generally than this, but uh, when P is the KL divergence of a, a triple in the set, setting of singular learning theory, this density of states function is uh, asymptotically a constant times S to the power lambda minus one. A is some constant, and lambda is the RLCT. Okay, so you can see then that uh, the, RL, the density of states will diverge to infinity, as it did in the previous example, uh, if lambda is less than 1, and converge to 0 if lambda is greater than 1. Uh, but this asymptotic behavior of the density of states um, gives you some hint that lambda behaves like a dimension, right? So recall from my very first example that the density of states in the case where a function is a sum of squares was proportional to uh, t to the n on 2 minus 1. Right? So in the regular case, this exponent in the density of states is half the dimension. And you see here that the RLCT sort of generalizes that even to the cases where the function is not a sum of squares. So this is, um, what this has to do with learning and generalization and so on is a topic for another time, but uh, hopefully this gives you some, the beginnings of a geometric intuition for how to think about what the RLCT is doing. I'll stop there for questions. Thanks, everyone.